All right, in this lesson, we're going to take a look at hemoglobin. So the first thing we want to look at when we're talking about hemoglobin are the normal values for our patients. And hemoglobin is going to be normal depending on, or it's going to fall into two different categories, whether your patient is male or female. So males have a normal hemoglobin level of 13.5 to 16.5 grams per deciliter, and females have a normal hemoglobin level of 12 to 15. And I want you to take a look at this image, and I don't want it to, to intimidate you. It's a molecule for hemoglobin. And I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. First, you've got two different, uh, you've got a blue area and you've got a red area and you've got two of them. So it's an iron-based protein and they are attached to the red blood cell. And their job is to carry O2. And they carry other gases too, but they have a high attraction for oxygen. But if you look, hemoglobin has these, these little groups and they're called, there are four groups and you have two, uh, two alpha groups. So we'll call the, um, blue ones alpha, alpha one and alpha two. And then you have beta one and beta two. And they all do different. They all, they all have a responsibility of carrying oxygen. Well, if they have oxygen attached, we call this oxy hemoglobin. And if it doesn't, then we call it deoxy hemoglobin. So this one says, yes, we have oxygen. This one says, no, we don't have oxygen. But this is really important for something called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve that we're going to talk about now. And we're going to start by looking at this graph. This is called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, or ODC. And what it does is it looks at the relationship between oxygen saturation and the partial pressure of oxygen. So oxyhemoglobin percentage saturation, so how saturated it is and the partial pressure. Areas that have high partial pressure are areas like the lungs. Areas of low partial pressure of oxygen are like the extremities. So that's, it's looking at these two things. Now this curve, the first thing I want you to look at is that the curve actually at some point plateaus and it's usually somewhere in here. And what that means is even if you increase the partial pressure of oxygen, you're not getting any more saturation on the hemoglobin molecules. Now, the blue line is a normal curve, and the curve can shift right and left depending on some physiologic changes. And if it moves to the right, it's called a right shift. If it moves to the left, it's called a left shift. Now, what I want you to do is look at this. So hemoglobin, think of it as being sticky. And its stickiness is dependent on where this curve is. If the curve moves to the right, it becomes less sticky. If it moves to the left, it becomes more sticky. And when I say sticky, that means we're talking about the attraction. We want, so the further right it is, the less sticky it is, meaning it's the hemoglobin is less attracted to oxygen. Therefore, it will give it away a little bit better. So if we look at this curve here, here's your normal curve. So let's look at the partial pressure. If this is 50. That means the oxygen saturation is about 82. We're talking about the percentage of ox or of hemoglobin molecules that are saturated with oxygen. So if we look at the same line and there's a right shift, that means it's about, oh, we'll say 77%, 77%, and this is 82. That means if we, at the same partial pressure, if we shift it to the right, that means it's less saturated, meaning that the hemoglobin has given it up a little bit more easily. And there are things that cause this. So, and this will make sense as I give this example. So let's think about someone who's exercising. So when you exercise, you do what? You have an increased respiration rate because you're breathing harder. Well, increased respiration rate means increased CO2. Now let me back up for a second. There are three factors that we look at. So, or three, so we look at pH, we look at CO2, and we also look at temp. So increased respiration rate means that, and, and these three things, let me say real quick, these three things all influence left and right shifts. So if you have an increase in pH, we have a decrease in CO2, we have a decrease in tip, they all shift this left and right, meaning that it's the hemoglobin is going to be more apt to either hold on to or uh, let go that, that oxygen a little bit better. So go back to exercise, you have an increased respiration rate, you have an increase in CO2 because you're breathing more. Uh, you have an increase in lactic acid because you're breaking down muscle which means your, your pH drops. You also have an increase in core body temp from working out. So if we look here, so if you decrease, you had that right shift, 
you get this decrease in pH. Then you're going to have an increase in CO2. You also, the, this also influences the pH. You also have an increase in body temp. So a person who exercises is going to have a decreased pH because of lactic acid breakdown or lactic acid doses. You have an increase in CO2 because of an increased respiration rate. You have an increase in body core temp. It causes a redshift. Why does this make sense? Well, if every time the red blood cell goes to the lungs, picks up oxygen, comes back and says, hey, I need to get rid of this oxygen because those muscles need it more, that's going to cause this right shift. Means, why should I hold on to this oxygen? I don't need it. The tissue does. So that's why it's a right shift. So with a left shift, it's going to be the opposite. You're going to have this, de this increase in pH, decrease in CO2, or de decrease in body temp. But the big takeaway from this is that I want you to understand what happens when the curve shifts right and left and, to, and think about the things that are happening so that you can predict what's going to go on with your patient. Oh, hey, my patient's body temp's going up. That means what for his respiration? It's not super black and white, but I'll, these will help you make predictions uh, about the outcomes of your patient, and it'll help you make uh, better planning for your patient. So what kind of special considerations do we need to think about when uh, we're drawing these blood samples? Well, first off, you, you're going to say send it in a lavender top two, which is, has the EDTA, which is an anti-clotting additive. And just like with our RBCs, we want to think about technique. We want to understand that if we use something uh, too small of a gauge of a needle or tubing, or that we force the blood sample into the tube, you're going to get hemolysis and breakdown. Hemolysis means that you have hemolysis, you're literally breaking down the red blood cells, means you're going to have a decrease in RBC production, which means you're going to have a decrease in uh, hemoglobin, and it's not going to be accurate, and that could impact your patient. So what happens if our hemoglobin values are abnormal? Well, if your hemoglobin values are elevated, you need to, uh, you know, these are things that can cause it would be dehydration. So here's your test tube, and it's got this, your total blood volume. And this is the amount of red blood cells. And this is plasma here. Well, if you're dehydrated, you have less water, less plasma. That means your RBCs go up, which means that you're going to have an increase in hemoglobin. Okay. There's another condition called polycythemia vera. That is a type of bone marrow cancer that causes an increase in RBC production. Also, is some other cells, which means your hemoglobin is going to go up. The treatment for this is something called bloodletting, which is literally uh, using phlebotomy to pull off volumes of blood so that you can decrease the total blood volume and therefore decrease the amount of red blood cells. The other thing that you can do is hydrate your patient, um, and some medications help with this. Also, think about lung disease. So lung disease means you have an increased need for O2. You have an increased need for O2. That means you're going to have an increased need for RBCs. So you could have, you could see some mild elevations with lung disease like pulmonary fibrosis or COPD. Other medical therapies like EPO. So EPO is erythropoietin produced in the kidneys. So if your patient has like a chronic kidney disease, they may be on EPO supplementation, which will cause that hemoglobin to be um, elevated. Conditions that you might consider a decrease in hemoglobin, uh, thalassemia, which is, it's a genetic disorder that causes uh, the effects of red blood cells and hemoglobin production. You may see it low in that one. If you have some sort of hemorrhage, uh, if you've got sickle cell anemia or aplastic anemia, certain types of cancers, obviously your treatment for anemias and blood loss um, are going to be blood transfusions. These blood transfusions are going to help increase that overall red blood cell and hemoglobin concentration. So for our lessons for this concept, we really focused a lot on lab values and uh, oxygenation for our patient. So let's recap. So Hemoglobin, responsible for carrying oxygen, and also carries other gases, but we want to focus on its ability to carry oxygen. If you have a patient that has low red blood cells, you're also going to have a low hemoglobin. So uh, if those decrease, if your RBCs decrease, uh, your hemoglobin is going to decrease too. If you have a right shift, you have this decreased uh, attraction and need for oxygen, which means they're going to be less sticky. 
it means it's okay to give it away. And then if you have a left shift, it says it's gonna be more sticky. It means a higher attraction. I wanna hang on to this O2, it's my oxygen. Also think about what hemoglobin does. Hemoglobin does, so if you have a decrease in RBCs, expect that you're gonna have that decrease in hemoglobin. That's our lesson on hemoglobin. Make sure you check out all the resources attached to this lesson. Now go out and be your best selves today. And as always, happy nursing.